On this episode of Urban U, we honor October as both Breast Cancer Awareness Month and LGBTQ Plus History Month with two of our CUNY experts, including author Sarah Shulman, who tells us about the social action group, ACT UP, and its fight to find a cure for AIDS in the 80s and the 90s. We look up at the stars with CUNY scientists at the American Museum of Natural History, Dr. Charles Liu, and make our last stop in the CUNY Street series with our colleges in the Bronx and Staten Island. That and more CUNY stories and news. Welcome to Urban U. How deeply are Americans worried about AIDS? A Los Angeles Times poll found that 50% of Americans favor quarantine for AIDS victims. 15% said AIDS victims should be tattooed. The earliest name for this disease was GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. Like today, you would never, a phrase like gay cancer, people would say that's absurd, cancer can't be gay. But at the time, they thought it could be. And so that was sort of the beginning of the problem. In Let the Record Show, A Political History of Act Up New York, 1987 to 1993, author Sarah Shulman looks back at how the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power was formed and how they changed the world with their in-your-face activism. At the center of the movement were people with AIDS, people who had no treatments and who were fighting against the clock. And their needs determined not only the agenda of the organization, but also the structure of the organization. ACT UP was leaderless by design. ACT UP was a radical democracy and different groups of people could do what they felt needed to be done. And as a result, you had a very, very wide range of actions. There was one called Stop the Church, which you were a part of and you said was a turning point. So we did an action in December of 1989 that disrupted mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Now, People did not want the action to seem to be anti-Catholic. It wasn't against the religion, it was against the policies and the politics of the church. Originally planned as a silent die-in to protest the church's stand on safe sex and condoms, chaos ensued when one ACT UP member stood up to verbally protest. We're not gonna take it anymore! You're killing us! Stop it! Stop it! My very first reaction was, oh no, that was so horrible because I could see that the parishioners were very upset by it. And I thought it was a terrible mistake. Of course, it turned out to be a huge turning point for ACT UP because the demonstration was reported on all around the world. It showed that we weren't kidding. And as Larry Kramer said, they were afraid of us after that. Through the use of what Martin Luther King called nonviolent direct action, ACT UP brought about many important changes in treatment, insurance coverage for those with HIV and AIDS, and availability of experimental drugs, just to name a few. ACT UP people became citizen scientists. They learned a great deal about science, about medicine, about policy, about housing, about drugs, about needle exchange. Um, people with no backgrounds in these areas. And then when you're the expert, you design the solution. And your your solution is reasonable, winnable, and doable. And you present your solution to the powers that be. And then when they refuse it, you do nonviolent civil disobedience in a very theatrical way that communicates through the media to the public that you have a solution to this problem and that your solution is reasonable. Tell us why it was important to you to write this book. I was really disturbed to see at a certain point that the history of ACT UP was being very whitened and very limited. ACT UP was primarily a white gay male organization, but it was not an exclusively white gay male organization. And that's a big difference because when women and people of color are in a movement, they have huge impact. It was a movement of very different kinds of people working in coalition. What would you say was the legacy of that time and all of that work? People put everything they had, all their hearts and all their creativity into their work. And, you know, many of the people that I interviewed talked about how ACT UP was their complete life. I think the biggest takeaway from ACT UP is that regular people can change the world. People get their rights because they insist on them and they take them. And certainly in the case of AIDS, Thousands of people fought until the day they died to force this country to change against its will. For Urban U, I'm Scott Kirby.
October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and CUNY scientists are leading the fight against this terrible disease. Dr. Jill Barganetti is a renowned breast cancer researcher and professor of biological science at Hunter College. She joins us for a CUNY conversation. Jill, thanks so much for joining us for this CUNY conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. When you look across the spectrum of the disease of breast cancer, where are you seeing the most exciting developments? Is it on, is it maybe in early detection? Is it in treatment? So for me, I'm really looking at treatments and excitement about targeted treatments and the recognition that breast cancer is not one disease, but there are many different types of breast cancers. And I think when people get diagnosed with breast cancer, they, they get a diagnosis that tells them what subtype of breast cancer they have, and then the appropriate treatments for those breast cancers. And many of them have what are called hormone receptors on the surface of those cells. Cancers are caused by an overproliferation of cells. Um, and so those surface receptors can be targeted with anti-hormone therapies. And those are very effective in combination with other therapies, of course, with surgery. So we're really in a great place for those cancers that have targeted treatments. And there's a lot of research going on for breast cancers that are less targetable, like triple negative breast cancer that doesn't have any of those receptors on the outside but people are looking for particular targeted treatments or in fact, potentially immunotherapy where um, treatments are given that help boost the human being's own immune response to help fight that cancer. And so just to give people an idea to put it in perspective, are these developments in the last decade, in the last five years, in the last three years, one year? Immunotherapy is, is very new. Um, so that's, you know, the past 10 years that's really been developing. And now there are a number of um, treatments that are approved for immunotherapy. And so that's a great thing. There are PARP inhibitor treatments that have been approved within the last 10 years, which are good for people who have BRCA um, mutations and those type of cancers that may have less targeted treatments available. The hormone receptor therapies have been developing for decades, um, and but now they're really in a standard of care mode, you know, com combined with surgery and particular different hormone receptor therapies. So those are really standard of care modes now. Is there anything, any developments on the early detection side that are interesting, or is it really still the same standard? Um, in the early detection side, you know, it, people are, it's still recommended that people get their mammograms and for men, if they see any difference in their breast tissue, that they recognize that men can also get breast cancer. And it seems that um, many, be between the treatment options and uh, the early detection modalities that are available, um, it does seem that breast cancer in, in many cases is treatable. Is that an accurate statement? Absolutely, not just treatable, but curable. Um, people you know, get treated for breast cancer and then find that their breast cancer is gone and does not recur. Wonderful, well, Jill, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, we appreciate it and best of luck with, with all of your research. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to share my excitement with you. Coming up on Urban U, a student with a big following for his virtual city tours at the height of the pandemic lockdown, and a look up at the sky with astrophysicist Charles Liu. Stay tuned. York City, undoubtedly one of the most dynamic places in the world. I feel really great to be here. As a nod to the city's vibrance, 
Queens College student Sifat Razwan has made it his mission to showcase the raw and uncut version of the Big Apple through his eyes. Most of the people watch uh, New York City uh, throughout movie, TV shows, but they also interested to see the real life, the real place, the real situation of New York City. And so he created the NYC Walking Show via YouTube. Welcome back to another video from New York City. With his camera and his feet, the Bangladesh native takes viewers on a journey through neighborhoods. For those who doesn't know, this is in Queens. Parks, streets, and attractions throughout the five boroughs. Done here at New York Aquarium. We have in focus on the Broadway theaters. So Frankie will lead us about the Broadway th theaters. Viewers tune in from around the world to get a glimpse of New York through his live streams and uploads, rain, snow, or shine. During the pandemic, I usually start my channel, the NYC Walking Show, because everyone is staying home, feeling depressed. So I thought this is the perfect time, even though it's not so perfect to go out and do film, but I tried my best to go outside and film as much as I can to entertain people, to go closer to the people so they can feel really connected with each other. It's 90 degree Fahrenheit, so definitely it forces people to get out from home. I remember one day a lady told me that she is disabled and she can't walk but throughout my video she can walk and with me virtually and she can go whatever she wants to go in New York City. And another funny thing I recall that one guy said that he lost around 30 kilo to just watch my video because while he's walking in his treadmill he used to watch my video because my videos are longer one hour two hour so this is how he feel motivated to walk razwan has also seen a tremendous growth in his subscriber list and he's captured the attention of publications like the new york post makes me feel proud that my hard work gets renowned from people it took me almost a year to just pass 1,000 subscribers. And after that, Christmas arrived, I made lots of videos and that's really boosted my channel. And it seems like I got 1,000 subscribers to 10,000 subscribers in a week and then 10 to 20,000 subscribers like in a day. Currently, I have almost 46,000 subscribers and it's keep increasing as I post more videos. Trekking around and filming the city is just one aspect of his overall intention. I think my show makes people positive, makes people to think differently than others. Because throughout my video, I always try to motivate people to spread some positivity to the world. So I think if anyone watch my videos, definitely they will gain some positivity and that will really motivate them to go forward in their life. And also they will definitely entertain. Abby Ashola for Urban U. But if you are here in Coney Island and if you don't try this, then it doesn't make actually any sense to come here. Thank you so much everyone and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Hey CUNY students, have you heard about the CUNY Comeback Debt Forgiveness Program? No? Well, let me tell you my story. By May when I graduated, I was about $4,000 in student debt. After I took my final summer class in June, it was about almost $5,000. I came across the Chancellor's Instagram post about the CUNY Comeback Debt Forgiveness Program. And I was like, do I qualify for this? I'm not sure. After doing some research and speaking to a colleague of mine, I realized that I was one of those 50,000 CUNY students that qualified for this program. And just like that, almost $5,000 in tuition costs was erased. This is one of the best things, besides getting my degree, of course, that CUNY has ever done for me. And for that, I want to say thank you to the City University of New York. Thirty-second space travel was essentially the idea that we put in the subtitle, key ideas, inventions, and destinations that have inspired humanity toward the heavens. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. 
not because they are easy, but because they are hard. He wanted to give everyone a comprehensive sense of what it was like from the very beginnings of the science and technology of space travel to today and the future when we actually are living in space as human beings. And this book on the major scientific principles of space travel is a really fun read. So the idea is to take these things that might initially seem complicated, it's literally rocket science sometimes, and to make it into something that's enjoyable. It's short uh, snippets of information. You can read it cover to cover if that's what you want to, uh, but you can really just spend a small amount of time uh, with the book and expect to learn something about one of the topics. And you couldn't ask for a more interesting group of 30-second tour guides to the history and future of space travel. Karen and I are both astrophysics professors, and we study the universe itself and how we've gone to explore it. Alan's expertise is actually a really neat bookend to both of ours, where Alan knows both about the history and all the cool old tech of space travel and rockets and so forth, and also the frontier things, the solar sails or all the latest kind of science fiction ideas that are being brought to reality by modern research. So this team is really an amalgam of a broad spectrum of knowledge and understanding of the whole concept of space travel. So let's talk about some of the ideas in the book. It seems that humanity began accumulating the principles behind modern spaceflight a very long time ago. And the first chapter, appropriately, is about the first rockets. So just how long have we humans been sending rockets to the stars? So the very first rockets that people launched were in the Song Dynasty in medieval China. And they were both for military purposes, like missiles, and for civilian purposes, like fireworks. Um, and so people have been dreaming about space travel for a long time, but it really became possible in the reality in the 50s and 60s. Almost the last chapter in the book is all about the brand new non-chemical rockets we're developing now. In 30 seconds or less, can you guys tell me about ion engines and solar sails? Ion engines basically take a very heavy molecule like xenon or something, accelerate it to very high speeds and shoot it out the back of your rocket. It's very gentle acceleration, but in space, over time, you can build up a tremendous amount of speed and a tremendous amount of motion with very little weight. And, turns out, solar sails are more than just a cool sci-fi idea that looks good on Star Trek. The cool thing is that even light has momentum, and so uh, photons of light bouncing off a mirror impart just a tiny, tiny impulse on the spacecraft. It, it's so tiny, um, you would never even notice it uh, on the Earth, um, but in space, in the vacuum of space, and over really long periods of time, it's enough that it can accelerate spacecraft. Well, so between between puttering and speed of light, where where are we in this? <laughs> you you would very much start puttering, um, but then if you did it for, or if you could figure out a way to do it for years or decades, you could get very 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 fast. For practical as well as hopeful reasons, do you think? Space travel draws all Earthlings together? Yes, absolutely. My few seconds worth on this is just think about Apollo Soyuz. During the Cold War, what brought America and the Soviet Union together? It was a handshake in space. The book is called 30 Second Space Travel, and it is so much fun. Fun book written by fun people. I'm sure you'll all enjoy it. The purpose of this book project was to translate the first feminist treaties. I'm so excited to be here, uh, reconnecting with my previous life as a historian, doing an audio recording of the first feminist book written in Puerto Rico by Luisa Capetillo. I hope when the book comes out that you get to listen to it. It is a great honor and it gives me so much joy to be able to go back and share with you the life of an incredible Puerto Rican woman Luisa Capetillo. On this month's For the Record, we take another dive into the history, not just of our colleges, but where they're located too. The histories behind the street names of our CUNY schools. This month, the Bronx and Staten Island. Starting in the Bronx, three CUNY schools reside in New York's northernmost borough. First off, Bronx Community College, BCC, on University Avenue. 
You might think this one's a no-brainer to kick things off. The school's there, so they named a street for it, sure. And you'd be half right. University Avenue did get its name from a school, but not BCC exactly. In 1894, NYU built the campus as part of a trend of several Manhattan universities moving north in search of more space. And when NYU moved back downtown, a street already named University Place was just perfect for a certain incoming community college, moving in in 1973. Next up, we visit Postos Community College on the Grand Concourse. So how did this road get to be known as a concourse? And for that matter, just what makes it so grand? Well, it was indeed designed to be much more than just another road. It was conceived by immigrant Luis Alois Ries, inspired by the grandeur of Paris's Champs-Élysées from his native France. Wide, walkable, and beautiful, this grand concourse was for a time known as the Park Avenue of the Bronx. Rounding out the Bronx, Lehman College calls Bedford Park Boulevard home. While the Bedford of Bedford-Stuyvesant was most likely named for a centuries-old early Dutch settlement or by English colonials, this Bedford is something else entirely. After the Civil War, financier Leonard Jerome began developing the area by opening the Jerome Park Racecourse, which would actually be the first home of the Belmont Stakes. As the neighborhood grew, a street and park would end up named for Jerome himself. While it seems the neighborhood itself most likely wound up named for one of Jerome's wealthy friends, Standard Oil Company director E.T. Bedford. And last, but certainly not least, our journey ends on Staten Island, the College of Staten Island on Victory Boulevard. Originally built in 816, the road was called the Richmond Turnpike, simply because it was built by the Richmond Turnpike Company. The toll road was actually owned by Staten Islander Daniel D. Tompkins, who would later become America's sixth vice president, serving under James Monroe. And a century later, the road was renamed Victory Boulevard in honor of the Allied victory in World War I. And with that trip around the boroughs, we close this chapter on the stories where our CUNY schools call home. For the record, I'm Ari Goldberg. We leave you with the music of Brooklyn-based Dominican artist Yasser Tejeda, recently featured in a concert series presented by the Kupferberg Center for the Arts at Queens College. Thanks for watching these stories from the nation's largest urban university, the City University of New York. Siente este ritmo que es de nuestra isla pa los caribeños. Fuente infinita, busca tus raíces, que esa es la verdad de nuestra mezcla, la unión ancestral. Oh, oh, oh.